This is Tabletop Deathmatch, a competition to find the next great tabletop game. It was entertaining. I don't think I would buy this game. Everything sort of flowed logically. Game designers from all over the country sent their prototypes to us at Cards Against Humanity. We picked eight finalists, and now we're bringing them to Gen Con, the biggest tabletop gaming convention in the world, where they're going to pitch their prototypes to our panel of industry-leading judges. One game will win a first printing paid for by Cards Against Humanity and be crowned the winner of Tabletop Deathmatch. This is my sixth year at Gen Con. And every year I play in less registered events and take more time to just wander around and play with anything that just looks interesting. And I keep having more and more fun each time I do that. Uh, I'm feeling really good. Um, I have a two-month-old baby that I brought to Gen Con with me. So I'm too tired to feel any anxiety or anything like that. Hey Bryce, thank you so much for coming to show us Aguirre. Can you give us a very quick uh, overview of the game? Aguirre is a historic Euro-style board game, which is both fast-paced and thematic, in which players must accumulate enough influence to survive the deadly paranoia of the mad tyrant Don Lope de Aguirre, one of the great villains of South American history. Cool, well let's see if you survive the mad tyrants of our judging panel. We have Paul Peterson, creator of Smash Up, Annalisa Delfell, the retail manager of Card Kingdom, Rodney Thompson, designer for Dungeons and Dragons, Mike Selinker, creator of the Pathfinder Adventure card game, Luke Crane, creator of Mouse Guard and Burning Wheel, and Sherry Spiro, president of Ad Magic. Do you want to come over and show us the game? Bryce, this prototype looks uh, really impressive. Can you tell us a little bit about the process of getting to this point? From day one that I heard I was a finalist, I contacted the artist Mackenzie Schubert right away. And over the course of the next three weeks, we spent about 60 hours finalizing art and creating uh, over 50 different pieces of individual art for the uh, three decks of cards and the cover of the box. I can't wait to see how this game works. Um, I'm going to step away and I'm going to let you um, run the game uh, for the judges and we'll go through a few rounds. But, uh, first of all, I want to ask uh, everybody uh, how familiar they are with the historical person of Aguirre. We had a long argument about how it was pronounced, none of which, none of us had any basis for any of our opinions. So I think you might want to start from scratch. Sounds good. All right. In 1560, the new Viceroy of Spain came to the South American Spanish colonies and found them overrun with all manner of villains, thieves, murderers, rogues. It was a bad place. He came up with the brilliant idea of, to get rid of these people by sending them on the last major Spanish expedition to go find El Dorado. He put a very popular conquistador in charge, and unfortunately for him, one of the members of that expedition was Aguirre himself, who had just spent the previous three years of his life revenging himself permanently upon an officer who had once had himself lashed. So he joins this expedition to escape what little South American law there is, and as expeditions to find El Dorado often went, it did not go well. Aguirre concocts a plot to overthrow Ursua, prop up a nobleman by the name of Guzman in his stead, has him assassinated, throwing aside all pretenses, takes over the exhibition personally, declares himself Prince of Peru, and uh, comes up with the amazing idea of sailing down the Amazon, up the Orinoco River, sailing around the top of South America, traveling overland back to Peru where he knows all the real gold is, and taking over the country for himself. This is as far as he got, where he conquered a Spanish fort, where he was promptly besieged by this Spanish South American military presence. Finally, a couple of his own men uh, captured him, executed him, and they were representatives of only a handful of remaining survivors. I'll deal these turn order tokens out for everybody. It doesn't just go around the table from the person who's first, it actually hops. Okay. Yes, okay. that's what you start with. Whoever's last gets to start with a couple more gold. Everybody cool, else I like this game. In between, gets one more. Uh, some recommendations, don't need the porter yet. No. Uh, don't need the trader yet. Don't need the cook yet. All right, I'll take the, the physician with the heart token. All right. We'll you get to one. advance your health level right away. He gives you a point just yep. for influencing him. And then plus two And he'll, uh, in case a health challenge comes out this turn, he'll grant you a plus two Got modifier it. to defeating it. Okay. All right, so I'm going to choose uh, Donianus. 
who gives you five points. You're now putting the pressure on everybody else. Uh, hey, Luke, it's your turn. It's my turn. I know, I know. Don't you know how to play it? I have a rule book in front of me that I'm picking from. It definitely is overwhelming in the beginning, um, just because there are so many things that are going on that you aren't expecting to do right away. I'm just picking randomly, uh, let's go wait, with the clerk. Clerk is a great choice because it's kind of towards the end of the line, but you'll get to buy first. I thought Aguirre was a really good example of a worker placement uh, Euro style game. I am going to put a chip on the lieutenant. Okay. Okay. She, she mods her board right away. Two yep. And it will be a plus one modifier for whichever challenge you take. I'll take the cartographer. All right. He gives you a success token. Hmm. What does he do? Quartermaster, he will grant you a point. He will give you a uh, plus one level to your privation track. And he will grant a plus two modifying bonus in case a privation challenge comes out this turn. He is a good guy to pick. I'm gonna take this one. If I didn't understand what was going on, I appreciate it when a game kind of walks me along and just the, the world is moving, uh, the gears are turning, and I'm trying to figure out what's going on and trying to stop myself from being ground up in them. So I, I felt that was a real plus for this game. All right, our first challenge is a privation challenge. No, that's not what we want. Which is our primary challenge, and the secondary challenge is native. Uh, so you picked the, the right one, the right guy. Good job. So first, uh, player number one, to beat the primary challenge, you need to spend uh, four gold. Nope. To beat the secondary challenge, you need to spend, since you're at two, only two gold. I will do beat the secondary challenge, because I have Yay. already hit the... Good job, Mike. Uh, yellow. Uh, both of those tracks uh, in question are at one, so you can spend three to pass the secondary or four, four to pass the primary. Or I could use my success. Or token. you can use your success token to pass without spending anything. Hello. I will say pass the privation oh, token. I would like to pass the primary. You will only need to spend one to pass that because, oh, because your track is at two, and he adds plus two to a privation yeah. challenge. Fantastic. What a deal! Well done. Are the challenges equally distributed in the deck? Yes, they are. I liked the challenge mechanic and how there were two choices and how, since it was a fixed deck, um, you were going to be able to predict later what was more likely to happen. That, I like to let the first this. player choose who dies so that if it doesn't go well, we know who to blame. Oh, great. Well, the priest. The priest. Luke. certainly had it coming. Oh, you're killing me. I really had a, a big issue with the assassination mechanic. <laughs> Literally. I mean, you, he's dying. And that was me. The priest is gone. Oh, Sorry. Oh, oh, Sorry. Arr, arr. Sharky, <laughs> don't eat the priest. What have I told you about eating priests? It front loads all of the complexity at the very beginning of the game, and as the game gets closer and closer to its conclusions, instead of gaining more options and, and being able to develop your own mastery of the game, you're instead having those options taken away from you. And while that's interesting and, and a little different than a lot of worker placement games do, Interesting isn't always actually fun. I had concerns about some of the mechanics in the game. For example, the camp damage track seemed really unnecessary for the game and punishing randomly. You have to decide, do I spend a bunch of gold to get a card to help me the rest of the game, or do I need to save that gold to help pass the challenge? Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm thinking about. Um, I, will, I will push my luck and buy the bandage. Is there anything I can buy for one gold? I'm going to fail the next challenge. Oh, wait, wait, wait. If the next challenge is a native challenge, how much will I have to spend? If the, if if the secondary, secondary one, one, you only have to spend one. So maybe I hold on and don't buy anything. Plus, you took the soldier this turn. He's going to add plus two. To what? To a native to challenge. To a native. So if a native challenge just comes back, it comes up. So you can't any pass other it challenge. Even. So if I'm not mistaken, any challenge other than a native challenge, I will fail. Yes, you will. Uh, if I have a native challenge, I won't need to spend any gold Correct. at all. Yep. I'm spending my gold. I like it. But just uh, remember, you'll be in the same situation next turn. Too. Yeah, well, you know, somebody's going to be able to buy... I'm going to get the one token, and I'm going to be able to buy the... Uh, get the five gold. I liked that the the uh, challenge mechanic of the, you know, this. there's two challenges, and you might be planning to try to get uh, some of your gold to to stop one of them, but you might get lucky and then you get another thing. And there's a lot of luck in the game that, that kind of seemed like it should be there. Is there any catch-up mechanic in this game? Uh, yes, there is, yeah. What, what would you say it is? A catch-up mechanic is a mechanic that appears in games that helps players who are lagging behind in that game catch up to the leader. These are often used as a balancing mechanism to make sure that by the time the end of the game comes, everyone is invested in the game and excited to find out the outcome. You know, let's imagine that I look at the rest of the game. I see nine. I see six more turns coming. Um, I'm, I'm low on 
low here, low here, low here. Is there anything that's likely to happen that, that I'm gonna look forward to? Uh, the way I've designed the game is that about half the points are awarded during the game itself and half in all the end game bonuses. So it's never gonna be apparent that you're needing to catch up. There's gonna be opportunities for you to uh, make up these points all around. And this, this is an aberration because it's only three rounds and you're way back there. But Typically, I'd just like to clarify, even though it's an aberration, I won. Yes. <laughs> Very important. Yes. I'd just like to clarify that. I am so conflicted about this game right now. I feel like it's got so many things that I was really interested in and liked, and yet there's so many other things that really just turned me off to the game. Well, I think we're going to uh, hold on to your prototype for a minute and uh, uh, have a talk amongst ourselves. And uh, we're going to uh, kick you out, and we'll see you in a few minutes. All right. Uh, they really liked uh, how the game looks right now. Uh, and that's a testament to all the hard work that the artist and the designer and myself have spent the last few weeks in preparing this uh, Game Crafter edition of the game. And they liked how the game flowed. Um, the questions that came up during the game were very minor, easily explained, and after we only had time for a few rounds, but everybody seemed to feel really comfortable with it by the time we finished. Um, so, so let's let's talk about the design here. Um, so I think I, I'm completely in love with a lot of the illustrations that Mac did, um, but I think it, it looks to me like there's a lot of graphic design problems and usability problems with the game. So I think I think some of the icons are really suffering. I think just the overall like aesthetic of the board and the pieces, it doesn't mesh to me. Like these icons don't go with this board, don't go with these characters. I also didn't like it, but in a very different way. Um, this is very Web 2.0. Like, I mean, this is like, you know, uh, a nice simple font and, and big, big bold colors and so forth. It's great, except that's not a game about, uh, you know, this time period. Why is a game about uh, a mad Spaniard in, on the Orinoco got web 2.0 graphics, right? I want these sheets to be starving soldiers collapsed right. and like, you know, in makeshift barges. Like, I, I've these look seen, too modern, don't they look too I've modern? I've seen a Gary Wrath of God. I like, trying to sure. do though. I mean, just based on the board box, itself, the game box itself, he's, he looks like he is trying to introduce us to do two different styles. So put this guy's face in the middle thing. of the board then. What do you mean the river <laughs> yeah. We're not using the board. I think it could have gotten away with looking a little more period piece and not so bright and still stood out. What was hard for me was those cards are all over there. The icons are this big. I really don't know the cards that well. I would have liked, you know, a character right. sheet. That would have helped me so much. And then I could have looked at the character sheet, okay, these are gone, and then, you know, made my choices. I stuck with a strategy that worked the first turn, and I got lucky that it worked throughout the game. Felt like you were, like, flying by the seat of your pants? I, no, I, after the first turn, I felt like that was the safest thing for me to do. The thing I thought was hard about it was reading the cards and um, seeing what their different characteristics were. I wanted to ask you a question, Rodney. Were, were you pursuing a, a deliberate strategy from the beginning of the game? Did you assess this game and say, yes. I know what to do, I'm going to pursue a strategy? Uh, I don't know that I know the but, correct right, thing to do, but, but yes. Yeah, I, I did. victory point strategy? Yes. Right. All right, I was too. Uh, I, was, I actually pursued the gold strategy. Yes, I noticed. I deliberately played a losing strategy and lost. So, I mean, there's, there's actually something for that in the design. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I have some very strong positive feelings, and there's some pretty strong negative feelings too, but one of the things I thought that was really good is that this is a game that has multiple paths to victory without a ton of different subsystems, right? Like you can choose to pursue these different goals, and it's all built into like the very base game. You make that choice sort of on a strategic level, or don't, but you know, like obviously Luke and I had made that choice, and that's, that's something that can actually be kind of tough to pull off, I've, I've found, without dealing like with, okay, there's this whole other mechanical subsystem you have to deal with for each of the paths to victory. So I, I, was, I was pleased with that, because you know, that's something I want out of a strategy game. The core mechanics in the game were really, really well done. I really appreciated the fact that there was a nice transition between the phases of the game. Everything sort of flowed logically, and the game didn't have a lot of extraneous subsystems or other rules. Everything flowed together very naturally. A lot of these mechanics are also fairly modular and you can like them on their own. Like I really liked this token thing where you do the challenges and you choose which one and get a token and then you'd feed those tokens back into the system to help you out. I thought that was really nice. I, I, 
I would like to say something in, in that uh, mechanic's favor, actually. So again, he's avoided a trap of, of these strategy games, and that is this game has uh, an eat your vegetables mechanic, right? Uh, uh, feeding your family in Agricola, paying taxes. But it's not pure punishment, because you do get the token out of it, right? And I think that's actually, he's done something really interesting with uh, you know, making you feed your family, but it's not purely a drain on your resources. It simply forces you to convert one resource to another one. I really liked how he would clearly put a lot of thought into avoiding some of the pitfalls that strategy games often fall into. For example, I really liked the fact that he looked at the challenge mechanic, which can often feel very punitive, and found ways to ameliorate some of the punishment that a player might experience at the hands of, you know, maybe an unlucky draw. At the same time, you know, that also had some of its own problems. Once that paranoia phase rolls around and they have to see the person they were talking to with this this turn potentially die, there's a connection to that person. They don't want that to happen, both because yeah. They know it's a useful person, they want to influence him some more later in the game, and because there's some negative connotations with having him die in the form of some negative victory points. Well, also, it's your it's your man, you know? Yeah. It's your guy. Like, you get a little RP oh, in yes. there. It's like, you don't want that guy to go out like that. That's not fair. It's not fair at all. Over the course of a game, people definitely grow attached to a handful of characters in particular. I was surprised that with how many components and how many uh, things are happening with the game, that it was relatively easy to continue playing as a novice mm -hmm. and not completely die. I surprisingly thought that it was easier to play than I expected it to be with all the different mechanics that were going on. I respect the uniqueness of the sort of assassination mechanic, but the game has a negative interest curve. As the game goes on, your options are getting more and more limited, as opposed to many games like this where your options grow and you have a chance to expand your strategy. I mean, you, you see that in all kinds of worker placement games, or, or uh, all kinds of games, right? I, I, I can see why you think that's a negative, and, and I agree to a certain extent, but also one of the biggest problems in Agricola is that when you get up to the 14th card, your choices are so big and so important, and you've built in, an entire infrastructure based on them that like the paralysis gets worse and worse and worse in those games. In some sense, it's going to get easier and easier here. Fair, that's a fair point. Well, but like, why are there so many options at the start of the game? Like, why do there need to be 16 players in this? He, he even pointed out two characters like, don't choose these on the first turn. Because 10 of them are going to go away over the course of the game, and then you're going to be left with one for each player at the end. I mean, that's... It was, it was interesting, like during the judging, everyone skirted around this issue, but the game didn't look very fun to me. This is how most of, I mean, this is how nine-tenths of all of my prototypes work out, which is you can build this really elegant, balanced system where everything is sort of in mathematical proportion, and it's just not fun. Like, it's really hard to make a game that's fun and has all these systems and is, and is complex, and... I think this game needs needs some work in order to get to that point where it has that, that real intensity and engagement like a Lord's Waterdeep or an Agricola or something like that. There's nothing about it that makes me really want to play it a lot, but at the same time, all of it's generally pretty fun. It's just not enough fun. There's really nothing, nothing wrong with this game. It's a perfectly fine game. As I, if it pulled out, I'd play it. I just can think of everything this game does, I can think of another game that does it and I think I want to play that game more. Like the thing that grabbed me the most was the story at the front of the game. Like I was right on yeah. tenterhooks as that's going on. I'm like, yeah, great, we're gonna we're gonna go up the, the Orinoco and, and people are gonna get assassinated and oh no, I might get assassinated. Wait, I'm never gonna get assassinated. I wasn't sure when I was competing. There's no danger to us. Right? I mean, there's a danger to our score, and my, res my reaction to the game was, yeah, all right. I didn't feel like there was enough Agira uh, in the game. Like, I didn't feel like we were being led by this mad Spaniard down the Amazon, you know, to our doom. Well, I mean, I love the story, and I really want that to come out more in the game. So we've got a $10,000 budget to produce the winning game and put it into a first print run. Do you think that's feasible with, with something of this scale? I mean, even just, you know, it, let's say we wanted to do the, the custom plastic pieces, like the tooling and the setup is going to be Tight. pretty substantial. Tight. Yeah. What, what could you get? 250 games? I don't know. These, these are very nice, but if they went to, to, to more cardboard shits, essentially, of different of us. Uh, there, and there are some, I'm sure there's stock ones we could buy that would work that are, you know, fine. So to hit the retail mark of the game, I think very simply I would do thin boards that uh, fold up around the uh, edges of the game, the, the individual boards. Uh, the big board, if we kept the big board the way it was, would uh, 
would be a uh, relatively expensive component. But to keep the cost down, I think that the coins could be um, either stock coins of some kind that already exist, or they could be made of chipboard. All right, well, let's call Bryce back in and let him know what we thought. Bryce, thanks again for showing us Aguirre. We had a really interesting conversation about it. Yeah, for the complexity of the game, we felt that it was accessible. We also really liked the uh, the token mechanic that you used and how you turned them in. Regarding the manufacturing, we have to take a close look at the pricing because of all the boards and tokens. While there were a number of mechanics that we did think were really well done, at the same time, there were also quite a few that were pretty divisive, including the lack of a catch-up mechanic. So thanks very much for showing the game, and uh, we'll see you again at Final Judging. Thank you very much. Feedback about um, lack of a catch-up uh, mechanism uh, I think is a valid concern for any game. For Aguirre, I feel like uh, the catch-up mechanism is built into the game for all players to use equally in the form of selecting the different personalities every turn. Uh, I think the point about production is a valued one. Kingcrafter told me this was the most expensive of the finalist games that they made. I think it's something we can uh, address in a worthwhile way though. Mm -hmm.